stay for the second half. Is everybody having a good time so far? Yeah, pretty, good. pretty solid start, I think. Absolutely. So I'm going to lower the bar now with my talk. Let's talk about Homo habilis, you. Looking back at our ancient ancestors for tips on maybe how to make ourselves and our students better prepared for a wildly changing future. Now to keep in theme with this, uh, the ancestor I'm talking about is Homo habilis. Uh, and to keep in theme with today's head of, what was it, sex, tech, and rock? Yes, sex, tech, and rock. Uh, does anybody know what the first tech was? Let's talk technology. What's the first tech out there? Anybody know? Fire. Fire spears, yeah. No, the first tech was rock. Oh, I killed two birds with one stone. Rock was the first tech. Uh, sex, you got to do on your own. Go get Justin to help you out with that, all right? So... The actual first technologies and tools ever produced by not even humans were rock, stone tools that were manufactured, chipped and shaped quite intentionally to be made into one sharp side that's a stone axe, a handheld little stone axe that you could cut sinew and tenu and, and hide and actually break bone with. And that was mostly what it was used for, to break bone to get into bone marrow, a delicacy in today's world, an even greater delicacy two million years ago when Homo habilis, the guys that made these tools, we're using it to increase their food supply, increase their resources, increase their opportunities and their outlook. And that's what all tech really does, isn't it? That's what technology's for. And Homo habilis was the first tool maker to do it. Let's have a hand for Homo habilis, shall we? All right, and who is this Homo habilis of which we speak? Let's take a look at Mr. Habilis, and uh, there he is, Homo Habilis, a.k.a. Handyman. Handy, because he was handy with tools, and he's a gigantic skeleton. I don't know. Hey, that's just a fossil remnant. Let's put some hair on the guy. Homo Habilis with hair. Here's what he really looks like. Well, what's so special about this guy? We already pointed out. Uh, the first tool maker, first innovative pre-human to make technology. Uh, he had a bigger brain than anyone that came before him, a trend that would continue on up the evolutionary ladder till you get to Homo sapiens. Uh, he looks like something from Planet of the Apes to you, but he actually is more human looking than anything that had come prior. And he lived about a million and a half to two and a half million years ago. He had a really good one million year run at things. Now, let's place this in context. There will be a test after this, so do take notes. Uh, one and a half million, uh, two and a half million years ago, most people think of human evolution, and all evolution is this very linear thing. Oh, cool. <laughs> Here's a graph. It's easy. Uh, there's a monkey, then the monkey stands up, then the monkey makes tools, then he turns into kind of a human, makes bigger tools, then he's a full human, makes nuclear weapons, and has reality TV. That's the whole evolutionary track right there. Uh, the reality, of course, is it's never quite that easy. It's not that simple. And we have a human a family tree of evolution. Surprise, surprise, but actually it's better to call it uh, the human family bush is a better way. It's not a line, it's a tree. It's not really a tree, it's a bush. Uh, what I mean by this is that as humans actually separated off from our uh, uh, monkey friends maybe seven million years ago, they went off into another tree and evolved off into chimps and baboons and all these other things. They're still hanging out in that tree eating bananas right now. Our tree is over here behind us. And our tree, more like a bush, uh, you'd have a genetic mutation and, and somehow you'd get this group over here, they are to pick this group, and there'd be all kinds of different species within that group, and eventually they would start to die off, and there'd be a genetic mutation, and then suddenly, oh, we have the Australopithecus group over here. And all the way over to the right, you've probably heard of at least one Australopithecus, and that would be Australopithecus africansis, the one up there, the three million mark. Uh, that's the one you've heard of, the famous Lucy, the skeleton that was found. This is the first group to stand up full time on two legs. And, but they weren't alone uh, because there was another genetic mutation and boom, you have the Paranthropus group. Another group that kind of looked more like gorillas to us and evolved in different ways. And lo and behold, another genetic mutation gets thrown out and here we have our boy, Homo habilis, the first in the Homo genus the first in the long line that's going to evolve into something that we call us. It's either Homo habilis or his close relative Homo rudolfensis uh, that came and evolved and morphed into uh, Homo erectus, 
uh, Homo Arcastus, uh, Homo Neanderthal, and eventually, yeah, Homo sapiens sapiens, the big uh, uh, monkey at the top of the tree, alone for the first time ever in all of history. This is the only time that a human-like ape, ape-like human species was alone. If you look at the rest of the tree, they always had folks with them at different times competing for stuff. And that's what I want to talk about right now is this Homo habilis in space and time. What's so special about him? Why did he start inventing tools? Why should we be looking at this particular species as someone who might be able to help us in today's world? Well, if we set the stage, just looking at this one band, million and a half to two and a half million years ago, when habilis kind of started up, he actually wasn't doing so well. To, uh, to be the evolutionary winner, he started not so hot. And actually, all the other ape-like humans or human-like species that were out there were doing quite a bit better. And the reason for this was that from about five million years ago to the present, Africa's been in a slow state of drying out. Five million ago, years ago, Africa from stem to stern was tropical rainforest everywhere. Everybody was in the same game. No matter what species or genus you were in, you were there. But then it started to slowly dry out over millions of years to become the Africa that we recognize today with the Sahara Desert and the Sahel and savanna grasslands. Yeah, that's now, but it was in a slow movement. And a couple few million years ago, this created a cauldron in which there was lots of different biomes and niches and little environments. And all of these other species from these other groups had slowly changed with the climate change to evolve, to be adapted, to specialize, and to be really good at getting food and staying alive in their own little particular niche. Now, all of these uh, uh, folks did it. I'll point now one particular, uh, uh, Paranthropus boisei, the one over here on the far, far right, uh, in the Paranthropus group. They evolved out really huge jaws, really big back teeth that were flat. What was so great about that? They could chew uh, almost like a cud. Uh, with a cow, they could eat grass and roots. And what's so great about eating roots? Because roots are always there. Roots are awesome. If it's a rainy season, there's roots under the reeds and grass. If it's a drought, there's still roots under the reeds and grass. So this particular species was well adapted, well suited, specialized to the max, and was doing awesome, was proliferating. Their numbers were growing, as were most other subspecies in these other places, except our boy Homo. Habilis, homo habilis, loser. He wasn't doing well at all. He really sucked. He, he, didn't, he didn't really specialize. He didn't adapt. He was kind of uh, an impish, inquisitive scavenger. Yeah, our predecessor, a scavenger. They'd eat berries if they found them here, eat these leaves if they could, uh, oh, eat dead stuff if they saw it, meat, anything they could find but they never specialized, they never quite got it right, and for the first, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000, half a million years, they were on the fringe. They were getting ready to fall off the evolutionary tree onto their homo habilis head. But a funny thing happened on the way to an early extinction. Anybody know what happened? The world changed. And the world changed radically, and it changed rapidly. So what happened? Even though I've told you now this is slow drying out of Africa, about two million years ago, there started to be radical shifts in the climate. And I'm not talking it radically dried out. I'm talking it radically dried out in 10,000 years and turned into desert. And then the next 10,000 years was biblical floods and it was a lake. And then it was drought again for 20,000 years. And then it was a rainforest for 20,000 years. And then it was savanna. And then it was back to desert. Then it was back to a flood and a, a, and a flooded plain lake. Okay? Well, this happened for 200,000 years. And at the end of this 200,000 years, who was left? One by one, all of these other species that had specialized in a very specific little niche and environment and were perfectly suited to that, died. They faded and went away. Handyman wins. <laughs> Handyman lives. Handyman kept going. Why is that? Why? Here's the basic why. Because any creature, anytime, anywhere, that becomes so specialized, it's tied to a stagnant world. 
It ties itself to something that's not changing and stable. It's fantastic as long as the world's not changing. As soon as change starts, it can't keep up. All the other species could not adapt quick enough, couldn't evolve quick enough, and they get left behind big time. In uh, a few bullet points, which I know is terrible to do, but this is college, right? So you've got to have some bullet points. Why did Homo habilis uh, survive? Early adopter of technology. <laughs> the inventor of technology and continued to adapt it. Uh, could work with their hands, but also their brains. So I can do stuff with this. I can make tools, but I can also think. I'm also looking around. I'm paying attention to my environment. Hey, why are those birds all circling over there? Oh, let's go check it out. Oh, there's meat there. There's dead carrion. Uh, they were curious. They were inquisitive. Why are those bees around that stuff? Oh, look, there's honey in there. They looked and paid attention to their environment. They were inquisitive. They went out and tried to solve problems, made tools to overcome Mother Nature. And they didn't do it well, but they did it well enough to survive. They were the jack of all trades. They were adaptable in a world where no one else was. Not adaptable enough, not fast enough. All the other genius, all the other species go away. Homo habilis survives. The Homo group then is the one that evolves up into all these other folks, including us. Now, why would I tell this fantastic story about anthropology, paleo stuff? I actually don't study any of that. Why would I have wasted your time with this? Because, my friends, I am utterly convinced without a shadow of a doubt that we as a species are once again on the brink, not the brink of extinction, we are on the brink of radical and rapid change in our society, are we not? Radical and rapid change on this planet, are we not? What's changing? Uh, I, the better question is, what's not? What's not changing? Society's changing, dating's changing, love and sex changing, all right? Politics changing, the population's getting bigger, all right? Uh, economies change, jobs and, and whole uh, industries are created. Uh, five years from now, we don't even know what they are yet. And they'll probably crash and burn 10 years after that in some dot-com bubble, all right? So economies are fluctuating, jobs fluctuating, industries fluctuating. But also think about technology. Stuff pops up so quickly now. Oh, I just invented this app. Tomorrow, there are 30 apps that spun off my app. Think about all the amounts of data that are uh, being generated every day, mountains and mountains of stuff that's uh, tell, telling us every fact and every detail about everything, everywhere. This is a lot of change going on. And then start to think about medical stuff. That's the fascinating part. Medical technologies on the change. Nanotechnology, genetics, genetic engineering. We are now at the point, our species is at the point that we are going to start manipulating our own evolution. And it's going to happen fast, it already is, and it's unpredictable. Thank goodness, in a world where everything's changing, including our own species, thank goodness, at least we can rely on a sound, stable climate. <laughs> Damn it, we don't even got that. That's radically changing, too. Huh. Who is going to solve these future issues, meet these future challenges? I don't know. If only we had a place. If only there was a place where we could bring people together, maybe the older generations with their skills and knowledge and meet with the younger generations to transmit that knowledge and talk things out and communicate with each other, challenge each other, innovate technologies if there was only a place. We could do that. We do. It's called the university. Let me hear a shout out Binghamton SUNY University, right? This is where we're at. All right. Universities are awesome. I rank it right up there with stone tools, one of the best inventions we've come up with in the last few million years. Uh, they're fantastic places to do all of these things and help meet future challenges and invent new stuff and innovate and survive. But here's the question, why do people go to college? Do you go to college because you want to embrace all this knowledge and grow and challenge yourself? and have your professors challenge you, and you challenge your professors, and think about big global issues and problems and solve them. Is that why everyone's in college? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you let me down, SUNY. <laughs> I'll only give you one guess. If you ask students and their parents and their future employers and politicians from President of the United States on down who thinks everybody should go to college, why do people go to college? Let's check the survey. Number one answer on the board is it 
get a job. We go to college, get a job. Really? Really? Australopithecus africanus had a job, and they're dead. All right? <laughs> and we go to college, and then we say, come into college. You might even have taken specialized classes in high school to prepare you for college. Then you're going to come here and take some specialized classes. You should declare a field of study, a special field of study. You should then declare your major. You should specialize. So you can go get a job. We're actually really not about that. The university is not well equipped to go get you a job. This may come as a shock <laughs> to some of you and your parents paying the bill, all right? That's not what we're here for. We don't crank out workers, we crank out thinkers. Hopefully we're cranking out people who have learned how to learn. Crank out people who are adaptable. So why should we go to college? Uh, I want you to adopt technology, but I want you to innovate it. That's what you're here for. Don't just learn the software. Learn how to blow it up and make it better. This should be common practice. Don't learn it. Take it apart. Uh, you should work with your brain, and I would argue increasingly you should be working with your hands. We have lost this in our society. We're like, oh, you're a plumber or a potter or a stonemason? Ew. Yeah. You work with your hands? What's wrong with you? Actually, they make more money than I do as a college professor, but we'll forget that for a minute. <laughs> we need to get people thinking with their brains, working with their hands, and I don't mean so they have a job to fall back on. I mean innovators in society know how to work with materials. They know how to think, and they know how to work and build and do stuff. Uh, Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs and them, they know how to take computers apart, tear them apart, put them back together, make them better. Those are your idols right there. They work with their hands. We should be doing this at uh, college as well. Learn stuff, but get curious. That's really what college is all about, getting you lifelong curious, like homo habilis. Be thinking all the time, I want to know why. I'm thinking about these other issues, not just my job I get paid for. I want to be a lifelong, curious, inquisitive people. Those are the problem solvers of the future. And mostly, all put us all together, you got to be adaptable. You've got to have tools in your tool belt when you get out of college to be curious, to have different skills in different places. You don't know what your job is. We don't know what your job is going to be. Think about all these technologies. They didn't exist 10 years ago. How can we prepare you for jobs that don't exist yet? We can't, but we can prepare you to think and act on your feet and be able to pull from different places Build skill set, knowledge set, so you can innovate like homo habilis. Keep going, because in times of rapid radical change, I want everyone to remember, there's actually a little habilis in every one of us. <laughs> Thank you, and have a great TEDx event.